Let's talk about UIL. Some of you sitting in the audience today may be people who have actually come in from out of state. You may not be a native Texan. So let me give you just a little bit of an overview of UIL and what that is as an organization. We'll also talk in part one about why do you want to coach? Why should you want to be a UIL coach? We'll talk about the specific speaking events that we have in UIL. Another critical thing we'll talk about are important dates, our basic contest rules and resources that we can provide you. UIL is your official state association. It is the oldest and the largest of its kind in the nation. Many, many states have state associations, but they are much smaller than us and they do not offer all the events that we do. UIL began in 1910, that was a long time ago. And even though you may think of UIL as a Friday night lights situation with athletics taking the forefront, UIL actually began as a dream of debate coaches. About 20 who gathered at the uh, Abilene, Texas at a convention for Texas State teachers and they came to the University of Texas in Austin and said we would like a state championship in debate. Would university consider accepting us and running that for us? And UT Austin said yes and made it a part of its extension bureau. We have now grown to over 1500 secondary schools over 3,500 elementary junior high, and our schools are extremely diverse. So when we talk about rules and we talk about contests, know that UIL tries to meet the needs of a very diverse audience of schools. Some as small as nine students in the student body, and some as large as well over 6,000. So you can see meeting the needs of all our students is very, very challenging for UIL. We do believe, and it is our mission, that our contest be enrichment and extension of your classroom. And I think that answers for you. One of the reasons why you wanna be a UIL coach is going to make your students so much more engaged in what you're teaching and the curriculum you have in your classroom. UIL sponsors 30 high school academic contests and 20 elementary junior high. We have the largest policy cross-examination debate tournament in the nation. And our one act play is the most extensive throughout the nation and even the world. So we are very, very large as this is the Lone Star State. One of the things that makes us very unique and attracting to students, parents, and hopefully coaches is that we have dispersed over $33 million out of our scholarship program. The scholarship program is called the Texas Interscholastic League Foundation, and we have scholarships that are sometimes 500 a year, but all the way up to 20,000. So students and their activity and their engagement in academics, going to and achieving that participation in the UIL academic speech, one act play, robotics, state meet, Congress state meet, any academic state meet will put them into a pool to be eligible to apply for scholarships when they become a senior. We will award over a million dollars in scholarships this year, and it's just an amazing program. You'll see on the screen there that we have, uh, I've provided for you that link to their website at tilffoundation.org. It's a great recruiting tool to talk to parents about when you want to get students involved in the program. So let's talk about why would a teacher who has so much on their plate, so many things to do, so many challenges just in the classroom alone, why would you want to coach UIL? Well, some of you may be sitting back chuckling and you may be saying, because I signed that contract that says other duties as assigned, and you've now been told, welcome, you'll coach debate. 
But I want to tell you that because our contests are deeply rooted in the Texas Essential Knowledge and skills, they truly will enhance your classroom as well. And you know as well as I do that if, when students get excited and engaged about competition, they will become more engaged in your classroom. Their attendance will get better. Their standardized test will improve. And what UIL Academics does is it challenges the bright but you know that oftentimes that bright child sitting in the back of your classroom is sometimes not engaged, sometimes underachieving. We think what UIL Academics does is that it helps a student to reach their real potential. One of the exciting things you'll see is the change that you will notice in students once they become engaged in the UIL speech and debate team. It helps them develop self-esteem. It gives them confidence. It gives them poise. It makes them feel worthy that it's okay to be smart. I don't have to feel like a nerd. I don't have to apologize for being a very brilliant student. You'll also see they'll come to school more. You'll also see that the state curriculum just gets better and better and you can go deeper and deeper with students into that curriculum. We see students become much more self-disciplined and we see that they are prepared, much more prepared to step out into the future and have a great successful future themselves. We see it as the whole student that is developed and there, there's nothing greater, there's no greater pride that a coach and a teacher and educator can have then when that light bulb turns on, that student becomes really excited about learning and pushing themselves and seeing them blossom into the gifted individuals that they can be. So why do you coach UIL? Yes, you provide opportunities for scholarships so that many of them have a chance to go on to higher education. But I think one of the greatest things UIL does and that you will see firsthand is it gives every child a place to belong. Not everybody is a great athlete. Not everybody is a wonderful musician. But UIL academics truly allows a student to feel like they can be engaged and they have friends and they are excited about school. What does that mean for you? I think it makes you a very unique educator, not the one who locks the door at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, but someone who truly goes that extra mile to make a difference in the lives of your students, and therefore your own career is definitely enriched. So lots of reasons to want to be a UIL coach. In particular, we like to tell you all about speech and debate. And in UIL, remember that the academic program includes 30 different high school events. So the unique thing about Texas is that we have a lot of different organizations that do sponsor speech, com speech communication and speech contests. So there will be a difference in the way some of us have different contests and different rules. But what you'll want to know is that because we're a complete package of math and science and business and robotics and speech, all those different events that we offer our students from second grade all the way to 12th grade, it means that there are certain constrictions that we have as far as speech is concerned. We actually offer six events from three skill categories, and those are grouped into debate, extemporaneous speaking, and oral interpretation. And then to that, we add Congress, which is sort of a combination of all those different skills put together. So two debate, two extemporaneous speaking, two oral interp, and Congress. In terms of the rules, of speech, students are permitted to enter two events in those areas 
plus policy debate, and then also including Congress. So in other words, when you look at those, let's go back for a second and look at these skills. In debate, there are two kinds of debate. There are two kinds of extent and two kinds of oral and terp. And what those rules mean is that you can do one in each one of those areas. So you get to choose between the two debates, the two extents, the two oral and terps, and then you don't have to choose it all for Congress. Anybody and everybody can enter Congress. Something else that UIL has is what's called the academic conflict pattern. And back in the 1980s, about 1985, the Texas legislature said that they wanted UIL to create a situation where competition could happen in a day to a day and a half in the way the meets were structured. Well, think about that. In order to take that many events and place them into a day time schedule that could be run early morning till evening and then be over with, we had to create what was called a conflict pattern. That conflict pattern is posted on the website. It's also in all of our handbooks so that you can take a look at that and be very much aware of all the different events that your student might be doing so that they are not training for two events that would conflict with each other in that time schedule. If you are coaching 1A, 2A, 3A, that becomes extremely important because we know that your kids wear all kinds of hats and you wanna make sure that you're not training a student who eventually could not compete because they're in a different event that conflicts on that pattern chart. So be sure that you look in our manuals we have a very special manual for you that we're working to get ready and posted very quickly. And that's the new coach manual. It's going to be posted on a page all specialized for you as a new coach on the website. And you can simply download that free, doesn't cost anything. And it will give you all kinds of hints and tips as to how to survive that first year of being a coach. My belief is that the very first thing and probably one of the most important things you can do as a new coach is know your dates, know what the deadlines are, know when things occur so that you can plan for the entire year. And not only you, but that you communicate to your students and certainly to the parents of your students. This is coming up. It may be coming up in two months. It may be coming up in three. But so you get all of those dates down, you eliminate the conflicts, and students are well prepared and parents know, let's don't plan a trip during this time because my student, my child will be participating. So let's look at those important dates. First of all, the, the first contest that we begin for uh, the entire academic program is Congress. And Congress is, uh, we'll just talk about dates now. We'll talk about the contest in just a moment. Contest in Congress is designed to go from region to state, region to state. And there's our two sanctioned weeks for your region to select a date of when they want to compete. And that's November 1 through the 15th, the first two weeks in November will be your very first competition as far as UIL advancement goes. Now, you have to be really in tune if you're going to coach Congress because it starts very early. Look at the September 10th date that will be coming up in just a few months. That's where you go online to the UIL Congress webpage and you submit an intent to participate. It just lets your region know that you want communication, you want to be in the loop, you want to know how, when, and where that region is going to occur, that competition. Your legislation from your, that your students write to your region clerk is also due on September 10. So that's something that your students have to start pretty quickly with. 
There is a contest entry form that you submit online. All of your contest in UIL will require that you turn in your entries at least 10 calendar days prior to that meet day. So let me say that again, that's an important rule that you will want to know. Constitutionally, you must turn in your entry form, the students that are gonna compete on behalf of your school, at least 10 calendar days prior. That gives that contest director enough time to be able to know exactly how many students to plan for, exactly how many rooms they're going to need, the facilities, and also the judging pool that they will need. Notice another date there, and that's December 1. If your student is successful at region and advances on to state, something that as a new coach you'll want to be very much aware of, I'll tell you now, and that is if you advance a student to congressional debate state, you will need to provide a state score. Now, that's something that you can very easily serve as, very easy for you to judge. But if you choose not to do that, be aware that you'll still have to provide someone. So get somebody lined up who has experience and is comfortable judging at the state level for Congress, December 1. So there are your dates. September 10 is important. November, first two weeks is important. And December 1. Your state meet in Congress this next year, gosh, 2022, doesn't that sound interesting? January 10, 11, and 12. It is traditionally held at the University of Texas in Austin. And the second day, if your student advances to the finals, it is traditionally held in the chamber of the Texas State Capitol. And what a thrill for students to get to debate in the same place that your state legislators do. Our next event in order of occurrence is CX debate, cross-examination debate. That's your policy team debate. It is also a, a two-level competition where Congress is region to state. CX debate is district to state. Two teams from each district qualify for the state tournament and your date can land within a six to seven week window based on when your particular UIL district and the district schools decide. There will be a fall planning meeting. You need to make sure that you are there to represent your school because that's where they will talk about setting the date, setting the sites, deciding who's going to run it and all those other details. So January 3rd through February 12th. The state meet is the middle of March, and it's then divided into small school, large school. So you'll see your date for 1, 2, and 3A is March 14th and 15th, and March 18th and 19th for your large school. Now let's go to individual events in speech, and that would be prose and poetry. That would be informative and persuasive speaking. And that would also include Lincoln-Douglas debate. There are two sanctioned weeks that your UIL district can choose um, when they are deciding when they want to do it. There's a District 1 and a District 2. District 1 is March 21 through 26. And District 2 is March 28th through April 2nd. So a two-week window to decide when your district wants to happen. In the speaking individual events, there are three levels. You go from district to region and then on to state. The region meet happens not quite a month after um, you would have done your district and that is April 22nd and 23rd. Um, we had very interesting region meets this year because of the pandemic. We hope everything goes back to some type of normal this year. And normally there are 24 different colleges and university campuses in the state that actually hold regions. And you can find your region by looking at the website 
and you'll see that I've given you the link there for regional information. That's also the link where you'll find your regional handbook, you'll find out the regional director and contact information in the event that you're not sure about how region works and you wanna ask them questions. So that becomes a very important link. If nothing else, go to the UIL website and pull down the red menu bar to meets and then to region and you'll be able to pull up that link there. Your state meet for your individual events and speech is different. It is not at the same time as your academic math, science, and those other events. It is held on May 24th and 25th. And just prior to that, we do a special coaches conference that gets you ready for the next morning of how to prepare your students. It does occur at the University of Texas in Austin. So you can see starting from November all the way through the end of May, you're looking at opportunities for UIL speech and debate. So let's go back in order of when we talked about these and let's talk about a little bit. These will just be overviews. I can't possibly give you all the rules and all the details for each event that you can find in the event handbook that we have made for all of the events that we do in speech and debate. But what I can do is give you a little bit of knowledge and an overview. Congress is held obviously fall and winter, and it is where students come in to uh, what we have created a legislative assembly modeled very much after the United States Congress. Contestants come in as legislators and they write bills, they write resolutions, they author those, they give speeches, and they debate these in the hopes that their resolution or their bill will actually be adopted by the Congressional Assembly. Congress is different in the way it's structured from some of the other events. It is regions organized by your educational service centers, not your UIL traditional districts that are set up for football, basketball, academics, et cetera. We actually take your ESC center and that's the point at which you compete. Now, what that means is there will be 1A through 6A competing and even though you may be mixed in with other conferences, you still advance as a representative of your own conference. So a 1A would not be competing against a 6A, only perhaps competing with in that assembly. So we do select a region clerk and we've already got those selected and confirmed. They are online right now. So all you have to do is Google UIL Congress and go to that web page and you'll see the contact information and you'll see based on your ESC assignment for your school district. And that would be either one, two, three, all the way through 20, one through 20 ESCs. And that's how those are organized. Remember September 10 is important. That's when you let us know, yes, I'd like to participate. I'd like for my students to participate. Are you punished? If something happens and you can't participate, no. This is just a way to let your region committee know how to plan. So they wanna make sure they know who's coaching Congress at your school, how to reach them, how to send out emails to them so you get all the information that you need. Again, we provide a handbook for you and literally every material you would use in this contest is posted on that Congress webpage. So just Google UIL Congress, all right? And again, that reminder as a new coach, don't be blindsided if you qualify a student to the state tournament. And you may think as a first year coach, oh, well, that'll never happen. You need to plan for it because as great a coach as you're going to be, it's very likely that that could happen. You have to be prepared to provide a score that is there for those that entire tournament. All right, let's look at prose and poetry. For those of you who love 
creative performances. Prose and poetry will be right up your alley. It is an oral reading event and the contest time limit is seven minutes. Within that seven minutes, you must have an introduction that leads the audience into the actual performance itself. You may have your students compete on other forensic organizations in the state, and they may have seven with a 30 second grace period, but that's not true of UIL. When we give you a rule of here's the contest maximum time, that's what it is. So it's seven minutes, that's your total time to be able to prepare a performance. As a new coach, realize as you read those contest rules and you examine the UIL Prose and Poetry Handbook we've created for you, your students will each prepare two performances. They have a category A and a category B performance. And you will want to look at the description of what what a category A performance must be and what that different category B should be. We do expect that you, as a school, um, protect yourself and your school by using copyright compliance. And those categories have to be documented. Now, that's a big word that you think, wow, what does that mean? I hope that you will attend some more of the sessions that we have for Capital Conference over prose and poetry. And we have specific ones on documentation itself where we're gonna talk about those. So be sure that you come to those. If anything becomes a stumbling block and sometimes students are not prepared, it's in the documentation area. So I invite you, if you're coaching prose and poetry this year, be sure that you attend those sessions and be sure that you read your contest handbook. That handbook, when you download it free from the UIL website, um, is rather large. It's actually kind of a textbook and probably, in my opinion, the best textbook that you will get to teach students about oral performance. So it not only has to do with contest, but it also has to do with that artistic element of oral interpretation. And I think it'd be very helpful for you as a, as a new coach and certainly for your students. Extemporaneous speaking. That's where we have two divisions. We have informative speaking and persuasive speaking. And it is where a student prepares, learns, reads, listens to, files, articles on current events. What's going on in the world? What's going on politically, socially, militarily, in different parts of the world as well as domestically in the United States? When they get to the contest, they are able to bring those files into the prep room and they draw five topics. They choose one. So five that they can take a look at and say, here's what I know the most about. Here's what my files cover. Here's what I'm confident in speaking in. And then they are given 30 minutes to prepare. Uh, they are allowed to use computer files. Currently, the rules do not allow them to use the internet just to Google that specific topic because we want them to be educationally prepared. We want them to, to do a lot of work pre-tournament in order to know all about current events. It's a seven minute speech then that they go into a room and deliver. Uh, they can finish their last sentence. Since this is a contest that's not pre-prepared, like a script in prose and poetry, but they don't get their topic, specific topic they're going to speak about until they get to the tournament, we do allow them as an original speech to finish that sentence, but seven minutes is what they're shooting for. Your young extempers may be thinking, oh my gosh, how can I possibly remember all the things I've got to say in my speech? Well, they are allowed one three by five inch note card when they're speaking. And we don't count the words on that note card, however they can read it, whatever they want to put on it, they can do. Um, there are lots of things that are important in this event. 
again, the pre-tournament preparation of teaching your students what to look for, what sources to read to be prepared. Um, if you wanna talk about COVID and the latest information about COVID, where do they go? Where are those credible sources? And to take a look in the handbook for extemporaneous speaking, to find out what can I take into the prep room and what is not allowed. Those kinds of things as a new coach become very important in extemporaneous speaking. Let's talk about debate. That's that other skill that we're talking about. And UIL sponsors two different kinds of debate here. That's your cross-examination policy debate and your Lincoln-Douglas value debate. So notice when I say poly, policy versus value. CX debaters get their topic announced prior to the school year, and they work all during the summer even to get ready, write their cases, and to begin their competition early in the school year. It's one policy topic that they argue all through the year. Now. Just because it's one topic doesn't mean it's small. It means it's broad enough and selected nationally. So people are arguing the same debate topic in Kansas, in California, in Florida, in Iowa, as they are in Texas. It doesn't mean it's small. It means there's lots of things to research in that policy debate topic. On the other hand, Lincoln Douglas value debate is a topic that gets released in the fall. We will release that in August prior to kids getting back to school. And they will use that topic at tournaments all the way through December. And then in December, we will release the second topic, which will be the spring topic that will be debated at district and region and at state. So there are two topics released for LD. There are handbooks for Lincoln Douglas and there is a handbook for CX debate. And the UIL also makes available uh, for purchase the debate quarterly that comes out from the National Federation, our sister national organization, but it's actually written by our own UIL debate consultant, Dr. Rich Edwards from Baylor University. So we do make that uh, as a study material. And I've got to tell you, if you're going to coach CX debate this year, it's what you want in your hands and in the hands of your student, because it is the first thing written on the policy topic as soon as it is um, released. And Dr. Edwards starts that research. It provides a bibliography of all kinds of great uh, sources that your students can go to. So I highly suggest the LD handbook, the CX handbook written by UIL, but also the policy debate quarterly written by Dr. Edwards. So that's debate. Now, as a new coach, this is important for you to take a note on. Remember how I said in Congress, if you advance a student to state, you must provide someone who can sit in the round and score. In debate, it's the same way. These are very large tournaments. And so it takes a lot of judges. In fact, we run over 900 rounds of debate in the CX state tournament. Think of how many judges that takes. And UIL hires their own pool, but also every school is um, must be prepared to provide an experienced judge. So here's what I want to tell you as a new coach. First of all, when you go to invitational tournaments with your students, volunteer to judge CX. They will be delighted. The tournament host will be thrilled that you want to do that. Learn how to judge it so you can judge yourself at stake. If you're not comfortable with that, then know now in the summer to start making relationships with someone who is an experienced policy debate judge that will agree to represent your school if you qualify kids to the state tournament. So you must provide an experienced judge. 
Um, the other thing that you will want to know is that you must also do that if you uh, qualify for Lincoln Douglas debate. So if your teams win, you need to go immediately to the state tournament webpage. Uh, we've gone digital like everybody else. We used to print all kinds of info, informational uh, material for you that we hope got in your hands from your district CX meets or your regional LD meets. And what we found out was people weren't picking them up, sites weren't giving them out. So what we do now is we create a state tournament webpage always Google that and you'll find everything that you need to know, all the forms, all the deadlines, and all the details about the state tournament. Whether that's the state Congress tournament or the CX state tournament or the speech tournament. We do four state meets within the umbrella of speech debate in Congress. Look for the web page and that's where you'll find your information. So as a new coach, how do you survive? What is it that you need to be aware of? Uh, what do you need to read? How do you need to prepare? Just like a football coach has to uh, design and study a playbook, we provide playbooks for you as well. The first thing you want to look at is our constitution and contest rules. Those are provided online. Um, you can order some minimal hard copies, but most everybody uses now a digital copy, uh, and that's on all the web pages for each of the contests that you might be coaching. So know your contest rules. The other thing that we do that is, is not typical of a lot of other folks is that we actually provide you a special handbook for each of the seven speaking contests that UIL sponsors. That'll give you your contest rules, that will share with you procedures so that you can prepare your students to know how does this event play out at a tournament? How should the contest be conducted? Your UIL speech website is certainly a place to go. Um, we give you lots and lots of information there. And we also, uh, provide in our online store, if you, your school wishes to purchase those, we have archives of digital downloads of final rounds of extemporaneous speaking, informative and persuasive, as well as our debate events and our Congress events. So sometimes it's nice just to be able to show your students, what does this particular contest look like? What's the level of expertise that is found in the UIL final rounds? How good do I have to get to be to reach those? So feel free to go to the online store and purchase those digital downloads. We also um, try to send you information via email a lot throughout the year, but in order to do that, you've got to go to our UIL speech page, the overview page, and there's a big red box that you click on, it takes about two minutes to register as a speech coach. We need to know who you are or we don't know how to get the information to you. So if you will take that time, really just as soon as this session is over with today, and you'll let us know who you are. The other thing though that you need to know is I'm not sure how many of you on a daily basis take a look in your spam folder or your junk folder on your computer, but you've got to, once you register, you also need to configure your computer so that it recognizes UIL, not as junk, but as important information that you want to receive. If for some reason a state tournament is coming up and you're not getting information, the first thing you'll want to do is Go look in that spam or junk folder and see if all the times we've tried to email you with information, it's dropped off the face of the earth in those particular file folders. So register as a speech coach, most important thing you could possibly do if you're coaching extemporaneous speaking, 
we post topics every month and we let you know, we shoot out an e-blast to you to let you know topics are up, they're new and fresh, and that will help you when you're trying to coach your students. You can use those. Uh, lots of things throughout the year. But again, we need you to first register. We need you to configure your computer. Uh, the other thing, obviously, resources. We do this Capital Conference every year, and I think you'll see they're, they're just amazing sessions taught by some of the very best coaches that we have in the state of Texas, and I think you'll enjoy those. Some of those this year, it's the first time we've done this, were actually pre-recorded because a lot of us just finished the national speech tournament. We pre-recorded those and you'll see those at the back of your program so that you can watch those even more than once as a new coach. If that's an event that you need expertise in, we think that will be very helpful. The other thing that you'll want to know to jumpstart your program is that we do super conferences and student activity conferences are super exciting to jumpstart your program and get your students involved and engaged and excited. So we do these in the fall and they are very much like Capital Conference, our sessions dedicated towards you as educators, the Student Activities Conference, those workshops are directed towards your students. We have introductory novice ones, if you have kids who've never done speech and debate before, send them to those workshops. We also have varsity ones that we try to challenge those students who might have done UIL speech for three or four years. So they are highly engaged and taught at a very high problem solving level. These are free. The only thing you have to do is get them on the bus. Normally, we do four of those and they rotate around the state, north, south, east, or west. This year, uh, the impact of the pandemic will reduce those to two on site. One will be at the University of Texas in Austin, and that will be in October, and one in the larger Metroplex area of Dallas. Fort Worth, Northeast Texas, and those will all be posted very quickly with those dates so that you can know what kind of sessions are taught and where those will be. But they are free. Like I said, just get them on the bus, get those kids on there. It's a great way to bond with your team. So those are resources that we provide for you. Again, register. I can't say that enough. Go to that homepage and you'll see all the things that we will share with you as well as what's on our website. We also encourage you to look into the Texas Speech Communication Association. Uh, their state convention will be um, this year in San Antonio. What better place to be? What a great city to have fun with. That will be at the Omni Hotel Colonnade on October 13th through the 16th. You'll get a lot. It's for teachers only and you'll get a lot of professional development. Uh, there's also a lot of UIL programs that go on. There is a UIL State Advisory Committee that meets there that you can sit in on even though you're not part of the committee you can listen to those deliberations so lots of ways to get engaged with speech people all across the state of texas and a way to become really professional and know what's going on with the state curriculum for speech and debate there are summer teacher institutes not as many this summer just because of the impact of the pandemic and some people are still doing summer camps and institutes uh, virtually but there are some throughout the state if you are interested in doing additional work beyond capital conference and also um, conveniently located for you is the national federation of high school state associations that is our sister organization and I serve as the chair of the National Speech and Debate Theater and Academic Committee. We have designed and written a numerous online coach training for you. There's a lot in speech and debate. There's a very important brand new course we just finished on theater safety, if you also direct one at play. 
Um, these are found at nfhslearn.com and those are certified courses online that you can take at your leisure and lots of great information there. So we try to provide you with as many resources. We don't wanna throw you to the wolves and say sink or swim. We really do try to provide as many resources as possible so that you as a new coach can feel confident and successful and fall in love with UIL speech debate and Congress. I can't tell you enough how important it is to find someone that can serve as your mentor. I will tell you that the UIL does appoint speech advisory committee by region, and they have all agreed that they are happy to mentor any new coach that happens to be in their region. We do have those listed on the homepage of UIL speech, um, and it has their contact information. Those rotate on and off every October, November, so in the fall, late fall. But those are some outstanding people who have experience in UIL speech and debate and can answer a lot of questions for you. As a speech coach, you'll find out that tournaments happen all throughout the year. There's not truly a season like you have for football or basketball or soccer. In speech and debate, we just do it all year long. <laughs> People are passionate about what they do. So invitational meets will begin in late August, early September, and they'll go all the way through up to district, region, and state. As you prepare your students, one of the best things to do is once again, get them on the bus, take them to these tournaments and let them practice. Let them see what it's like. There's nothing, you know, it's kind of like learning to drive a car. You can take driver's ed. You can read the textbook on, you know, all the safety traffic rules there are. But until you get behind the wheel and turn that ignition, it just becomes a, a totally different ball game of learning process. And that's what invitational tournaments do as well. They put your students in that competition arena to get them prepared and ready. Don't wait and just send them to their first tournament for district UIL. That's way too much pressure. Look for those invitational tournaments. We do post those on our UIL website for the dates and the tournament host, where they are, when they are, and contact information. So you can find those out. Choose somebody maybe that you watch. Go to several tournaments and watch the coaches and see who turns out to be really positive and has a great relationship with their own students and seems to have success, but not at all cost. You can find those people. Just be careful and choose them very wisely. Observe who seems to have honest fairness at, as promoting and who seems to have that element of integrity that would be a great mentor for you. If you are drowning and you don't know someone in your area, please don't drown, email me. Email me and say, I need help and I need somebody in my area that can help me. I will find you a mentor. We will discover somebody in your area that we can connect you with. All right, that's part one of our session. Let's take a little bit of a five minute break because I know that certainly you have sat for a while and this has been a lot of information to absorb. So take a, take a break, grab a Dr. Pepper or whatever you need and we'll be back in five minutes to start with part two. Feel free to enter anything into the chat that you would like to. Jenny is monitoring that and providing answers for you. And if there are extended questions that you have, Jenny will throw those my way and I'll be happy to include those in the discussion that we have uh, with this part two. What I wanna share with you is Building a speech team, how do you start? Some of you are entering into a situation where there's never really been speech activity for your school. 
And yet some of you are walking in behind a legacy, someone who created this amazing program and your responsibility is to not let it di digress at all. So there are kind of some different dynamics to deal with there. We'll talk about the foundation. We'll talk about how do you recruit kids into speech and debate. We'll talk a little bit about tournaments and I'll try to share some tips and hints with you along the way. I didn't share with you my particular experience in speech and debate, but I will say that I grew up in a small rural town in Northeast Texas, and there really wasn't this established program at all. My parents were gracious enough to drive me to Dallas and let me go to the public library and check out all kinds of books and then come back home and try to put together a, a poetry performance. So I was kind of on my own and I wanna tell you that's not the way to do it. Uh, I do appreciate my parents for that, but I did graduate, went on to Baylor University and spent time there and actually uh, became a part of the competitive team there in Baylor speech, uh, just a great privilege for me. And it was from there that I became a speech teacher. I did that for 21 years before coming to the UIL state office to work as your state director. So I'll share with you some of the things that I think are still very vibrant in how you reach kids, how you get them engaged, how to build a speech team, and some of the things that I've learned along the way, even as director at UIL. So I think one of the things that is critical is that you sit down this summer and you develop your own philosophy of coaching. What is it you expect out of yourself? What is it you expect out of your students? And then I think you actually put that in writing. I call it a squad criteria packet. You can call it whatever you'd like. You can talk to other coaches and say, hey, what does your handbook look like for your speech team? But one of the things that you'll want to include from the very beginning is what are your expectations of your competitors? What do you expect them? How often do you expect them to uh, compete? What are the regulations for doing that? What are the responsibilities? How do you expect them to act when they are not on your campus, but on a guest host school? You know, you've got a lot of liability the instant that you step off the curb of your own school district, put them on a bus or put them in vans and get them to another site. So, those are the kinds of things that you will definitely want to be reiterated in black and white. And one of the things you want to do is, first of all, before you share them with your students, and certainly before you have a meeting with parents, is go to your admin, go to your administration, your principal, and say, here's my criteria for kids competing on the UIL speech team. Please look over it, tell me that it's within school policy and whether or not you will approve this. That's your backup, guys. You wanna know that your administration will back you up when you're placed in any kind of situation that could be a little tough to deal with because kids are kids and they're teenagers and sometimes they make bad decisions. And as coaches, we've got to deal with that fallout. Um, and so, Talk about in there, in that book, in that squad criteria packet, what do I expect out of students? What are their responsibilities? When do I expect them to sign up for a tournament? And if they sign up, what happens if they decide they can't go? How do we handle that drop? Lots of consequences. You need to talk about, here's what will happen. If we go on an out of town trip, and you break curfew at the hotel, here's what, here's what will happen. These are the consequences. Do all that up front. Does it make it difficult sometimes when you'd like to squeeze that kid by? You think maybe there was a reason why they did some of the things they did? Yeah, it makes it hard, but it's going to be even harder if you don't have it in writing. If you have it in writing, your administration can definitely support you, and that's what you want. You'll want to get your kids to sign a commitment. 
And frankly, you'll want to have a night where you review all of this with all the parents and make sure they are committed. Have them sign that form because you don't want them planning. Uh, you don't want to work with the kid uh, in policy debate and have them qualify for the state tournament, which lands in the middle of March. What else lands in the middle of March? Sometimes it's your school district spring break. You don't want that parent planning a trip, a vacation during spring break, and then suddenly you spend all this time working with students and someone's not going to fulfill their state requirement. So make sure that parent signs that commitment as well. And look at the third bullet there, very critical for liability's sake. You are taking these students on trips and somebody will get sick. Something will happen. There may be an accident. Somebody gets a bad fever. Who knows? And particularly in the pandemic situation, that becomes even more critical right now. You need to have an official medical release in that packet. You can get that designed by your county health officials. Um, your school district probably already has one for their athletes, so perhaps it would be something very similar or identical to that. But make sure you have that medical release. And let me say this, don't file it in your file cabinet and not take it with you on those trips. When you get to a tournament site, you're in a hotel at three o'clock in the morning and someone knocks on your door to say, Joey's really sick. And you get to that room and his fever's 104, you have to take him to the emergency room. You want something official, something notarized that would allow that emergency room to treat him if you cannot reach his parents and those parents aren't with you. So medical release, very critical to have in that packet. How do you recruit students? Let me just throw some ideas out and you may have some you wanna add in the chat as well that we can bring up later. But I would say start where music and athletics starts. And you know where they start? They start in those younger grades. A music program in a school district is designed. Those kids start taking, you know, playing an instrument in fifth grade. And so by the time they get to high school, there's no choice. They automatically say, I'm going to be in the band. Or maybe that's true with athletics and even, you know, students that are playing athletics at a really young age, they make that commitment early. Don't wait till ninth grade to suddenly try to start recruiting. See if you can at least go to the junior high area. If your junior high that feeds into your high school doesn't have any activities or doesn't have any kind of speech course that students take, go meet with the counselors at the junior high level and ask, can we come over and recruit and see if maybe during the activities period that your students can perform or maybe they can go into a social studies class and do a model debate for that social studies on something that's being studied in the class. Ask if your students can go into the English class and read a story, read a perform something that maybe they are studying in that English class. Those teachers love it. The kids are mesmerized by high school students coming to their campus. So look at all the different junior high recruitment strategies that you can possibly brainstorm, get those kids committed and excited very quickly. You need to make friends with your counselor. The counselor can make or break who signs up for your class. If you get a great relationship going with them and they understand the quality of your program and of your courses, they'll guide those really bright students into speech and debate. And that's what you want the best and the brightest. So make sure you don't fight against a counselor, but you work very much to build a relationship. One of the things that I tried to do every beginning of the school year was when teachers got back to campus, they saw in their teacher mailbox a bright neon piece of paper, and it was a memo to them saying, these are the UIL speech events that we're recruiting great students for. And what we do was give a little blurb about each of the seven events. 
and what they entail, just brief, and then say, in the first six weeks, if you see a student in your classroom that seems to have talents that might be great in debate or might be a great performer in prose and poetry, please send their name to me. Let me contact them. Get that teacher input and let them know what you're looking for, what you need, and they'll be more helpful than you even realize it. I think another approach for recruiting is you got to make the kids feel like they're special. How is it prestigious to be on that speech team? Well, one of the things that I did was I went to meet with the counselors and the principal at the middle school level and said, who are your best and brightest? Give me your 20 best kids and give me their names and addresses. And then I would write a personal invitation, very professionally done to say, your student has been chosen. We've seen a talent from them. We'd like to show you what speech and debate is all about. And so we invited parents and their students to come to a showcase. And we would set out punch and cookies and create a stage and have the very best of my speech kids to perform, to excite them, and even to give testimonials of saying, this is why it's so cool to be in speech and debate at the high school level. Make them feel like they are selected. And most importantly as well, let their parents know. Parents are crazy about their kids and they get excited when they know that their student has an opportunity and they were selected from a whole group of other kids. So I think when you focus in on recruitment of those special kids that come highly recommended, make them feel special. You know, we walk down the halls of every high school and we see all these lockers decorated for the football team, the volleyball team. Why should our academic kids get any less? They should feel just as important to be a part of UIL academics than any other area of UIL activities. So once they get on the team, decorate those lockers, take the time to do that. One of the great motivating factors that I saw happen was get some squad shirts. You may have to start off with just inexpensive t-shirts, but go even up a level to uh, a notch to polos that have monograms on them or even button downs, you know, whatever is popular with your students right then that you know that they will wear and they will be excited about. Have those squad shirts and designate a day when they all wear them. Just like the football team wears jerseys, the cheerleaders wear their uniforms. Let those students begin to have a pride element of every Thursday, we wear our squad shirts and they become a part of a very cohesive group. So I think that's important. I think another way is show them off, show them to the community. Every chance you get, if the principal calls you and says, hey, you know, I got to go to the Lions Club. They want a student to come. Do you have any kid who can do anything? Absolutely. Never say no. Let those students go and speak. Let them go and perform. Let them go and just impress the community and the adults in your community of what kind of poise they gain through speech and debate. Great way. The community then will be very supportive when you go to administration and the school board and ask for additional things for your speech and debate team, whether that's a travel budget, uh, whether that's, you know, something that you need equipment wise, get the community adults on your side. And the way you do that is to showcase them any opportunity whether that's going to the nursing homes and doing something for the elderly or any kind of project. Maybe it's beautify the community and it's just picking up trash. That's okay. When they interact with those adults and adults see how grown up and mature and impressive your students are, that's gonna gain you a lot of traction. So recognize talents. Every kid is looking for a place to belong. 
and they won't always just because you do a PA announcement saying, hey, come join this beach team. There are a lot of kids that aren't secure enough to walk into your classroom and say, it's me and I'm going to be good and I want to do this. They are students that need you to meet them in the hallway, place your hand on their shoulder and say, hey, Mrs. Brown tells me in your English class that you did this awesome speech, this oral report. I think you'd be great in speech. It's that personal touch that will make kids feel like they truly can be something special on the speech team. So recognize those talents. As a new coach, let's go to the tournament. What are tournaments like? Some of you maybe are from out of state, don't know what Texas tournaments are like. Some of you may have never done speech and debate in your life. You just got told by your administration that you would do this. There are things you can do as a brand new coach on the circuit that will either impress or not be so impressive. So let's talk about some of those things that as a brand new coach, here's how you'll make a great impression. First of all, be early. Don't be showing up late you know, right at the time that a tournament should start because there's a lot of organizational things that go on. You need to be ready, you need to be early. Don't drop entries. Let me share what that means. That means that you show up on the day of the tournament and say, oh, Johnny's not coming. Sorry, should have told you earlier. No, 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 no. Jenny and I can tell you from organizing massive state meets, we need to know ahead of time. The further you can tell us, and yeah, there's always emergencies, but the further ahead of time you can tell us, the more we can revamp, resection. Speech is not like some of your academic events where you come in, choose a desk, get a test, pen and paper test, and put a number on it. Speech is so uh, more demanding in terms of detail. You have to be sectioned or in debate, you have to be paired. And there's just lots of detail that goes in far beyond uh, other events. So don't drop at the last minute. You are uh, branded as somebody who's not very organized and doesn't have a lot of discipline in your team. You also wanna know that you wanna teach your students. We don't drop. <laughs> You know, you cannot drop at the last second. You've got to either find somebody else that can fill your space or just don't even consider it, okay? Now, yeah, sometimes you have to substitute. And if you do at UIL, then know what that process is. We have a special substitution eligibility form because you can't just place somebody in the round we have to know that they meet state law eligibility. So that substitution eligibility form, which is found in your handbooks and also on our UIL website, has to be submitted. And that verifies, an official at your school is verifying that kid meets UIL eligibility. If not, you could get in a lot of trouble for competing with a student who has not met that requirement. So make sure you know the process, but do everything you can not to drop. If you absolutely must drop, then let people know as fast as early as you can. Do not ever wait until you arrive at the tournament to do that, okay? Do not ever do that. All right, um, maybe you have a student that has some kind of special need plan ahead. If you need some kind of a rule waiver or some kind of an assistance because you have a special needs student, there is a form that you fill out. We request that you do that at least two weeks in advance. Two weeks allows it to come to the state office, to be evaluated, to be responded to, so we can tell you what modifications in the contest we can make uh, sometimes we can't make all the ones that you want because it would be unfair to all the other students. 
but we certainly do everything we can to make sure that special needs students do get to participate in UIL. So fill out that form. It is online and it's also included in our handbooks, but just make sure you plan ahead. Another thing you'll want to do is not only be early to the tournament, but make sure you're on time for roll call. I can tell you for sure that at UIL, we have a formal roll call and it's very, very um, important. You have a lot of alternates sitting in the room that are waiting with bated breath to see whether or not um, someone doesn't show that they can take their place. So be on time. If you come to the state meet in Austin, there's a lot of traffic. You wanna plan ahead and drop that student off at the tournament headquarters rather than going to try to park on our huge campus and then trying to race into the assembly room. So at all costs, put roll call at the top of your list. And then you'll want to attend what we call verification period. What is verification period? Well, it's after the contest is over, you are brought as a coach um, you are allowed to come into a verification room and you're allowed to look at your ballots and see were they tabulated right. Uh, if they were in debate, did we get a win? Were we registered with a win? Were we registered with the right speaker points? You get to, to check all of that as a part of the process because humans make mistakes. And even though we have experts that work in our tabulation rooms, and that's true at district and region as well, you still want that second check, the coach's opportunity. You don't get to complain about a judge that you didn't like what they said on a ballot. You don't get to do those kinds of things. What you do get to do is to look and see that everything was recorded correctly, that you get to ask any questions that you would like about why did these people advance to the next round and mine not, any kind of questions can be raised at that time. Don't be somewhere else. If you are judging at the same time as the verification period is scheduled, then make sure you have someone else stand in for you and make sure that they're to represent you and your student, but don't miss verification. So as a coach, how do you survive? <laughs> how do you give all these weekends to speech and debate on top of grading AP English papers and taking tickets at the basketball game because it's your turn it's you're in the rotation for faculty I think one of the things is that you really have to look at a work-life balance you have to take care of yourself um, and I'm not sure speech coaches are good at that. Uh, I'm not sure I can say that I'm good at, as good at that as I should be, but you want to look at taking care of yourself physically. Uh, try to sleep, <laughs> even though you may have a lot of kids in hotel rooms on a regional tournament. Try to eat healthy, even though sometimes you're in that coach's lounge and you eat lasagna meal after meal after meal. <laughs> uh, try to exercise physically take care of yourself, but also take care of yourself emotionally. I think it's important to carve out time for yourself as a person. You're not just a teacher, you're not just a coach, but you're also a person. So how do you take care of yourself? Look for other areas. Don't just live, eat, and breathe nothing but speech and nothing but the forensic community. Don't let that be the only friends that you have reach out to other areas, have a life beyond forensics. Um, I see far too many coaches who gather their self-esteem based on how many trophies their kids bring home every weekend. And that's just not sustainable. So don't dismiss the fact that you are important as a person. Give yourself quiet time. Give yourself that moment of moving out of chaos into quietness. Um, and let me just say, lots of people spend hours and hours a day on social media. That's really not healthy. I suggest that you not get caught up 
in the negativity and the toxicity of social media. Somebody's always complaining, always complaining about a rule, always complaining about a judge, always complaining about a tournament host. Don't spend your time there. Spend your time on more profitable things that are more positive in your life. Are you going to be anxious as a new, uh, new coach? Absolutely. Um, you want to have a little anxiety because if you don't, uh, you become apathetic. Just don't let that anxiety grow to the level that it sabotages your attempts uh, in order to succeed. So what are my real bottom line hints for you as a new coach? Know the rules. Make sure that you have read the contest rules before you ever think about coaching or teaching your students. You would expect the basketball coach to understand the rules and be held accountable if they didn't. UIL academic coaches need to know the rules as well. And secondly, teach your students the rules. Make sure they are empowered to be confident in knowing exactly what those rules are. And I gotta tell you, Texas is challenging. Uh, someone said in chat that they were from another state. Well, get ready to fly because speech and debate is super active in our state. And there are lots of different organizations that you can belong to. Your school will want you to be a part of UIL. You may also choose to be a part of the Texas Forensic Association or the National Speech and Debate Association, or even the Tournament of Champions. It goes on and on. Know that those rules for each organization are different. And so for your kids to do well, be successful and be confident, you are responsible for knowing those differences and teaching those to your students. So know the rules yourself, teach your students the rules as well. I can't tell you enough, go to the website. The UIL speech and debate web pages um, are full of information. Long before you send us an email, I know it's fast to send an email. A lot of times Jenny and I will get an email that says, well, I know it's on the website somewhere, but it's just faster to email you. <laughs> Let me encourage you, go look at the website because there's all kinds of great information that you will be excited about. I also say, make sure you attend your UIL district planning meeting. That sometimes happens in the spring, so it may have already happened, but there will be follow-ups. Make sure that your principal knows you as a speech and debate coach need to be there to help make those decisions. I will tell you as well in prose and poetry, there are documentation requirements, so make sure that you follow those and do those well in advance of the competition. Again, go back and read the handbook. Chapter three is going to tell you a lot about that, and you'll want to make sure that you're prepared. Show up on time for that roll call. Train your competitors. If you've taught them the rules, they know they have seven minutes and seven only for poetry. Don't let them make a performance that lasts 655 because guess what when they get into that contest room their timing may be a little bit different and 702 702 just means you didn't really perform because they're not going to consider ranking you so make sure they adhere to the contest times make sure as a coach that you go to the verification period you can't complain afterwards it's too late even if your student should have advanced, but you weren't there to advocate, the results can't change if the official results have already been declared. So that's what's important about verification. Check your ballots always. Raise questions at that time. Learn what the ranking system is for UIL. Learn what that's part of the contest rules. We have that software on our website. It's called Talk Tab. 
And it is a complicated system. That's why we have a computer system that does it for you. But learn and understand how that all works. Plan ahead for, and don't be shocked when your kids advance to state and say, oh, I just didn't think the kids would make it, so I don't have a Congress score, or I don't have anybody who can judge debate. Be prepared, be ready, and believe in your students enough that you have made provisions for that well in advance of the deadline. And celebrate. Always remember to celebrate even the small successes that happen. The first few tournaments you take kids to, they may not win a trophy. They may not even get to semis. But that's okay. Celebrate something good that did happen, an accomplishment of students. And I think don't sell yourself short. Give yourself credit for a job well done. There are lots of teachers who would never give the extra time, go the extra mile that you have agreed to do. So pat yourself on the back. Feel good about what you do and what you provide for students. And I think the bottom line is make sure you're an ethical coach. We have an academics ethics code. And when you get to speech tournaments, you're going to meet some people who want to win at all costs. But that will come back around to them eventually. You will quickly build a reputation, good or bad, on the tournament circuit on whether or not you have integrity. So I encourage you, don't go down that hole, don't compromise, make sure that you are ethical when your students win and when they lose, make sure you're ethical. All right, Jenny, do we have any questions in chat that we need to answer? I have not seen anything else pop up. Okay, well, you see my admonishment to you is never be afraid to ask a question, whether that's the chat in a virtual session like this or sending us an email or giving us a call, you know, never, never be worried. Um, but I'll also ask in advance, don't wait till the last second. I've had people call me while they're on the bus headed to the tournament asking me questions that's a little late try to ask in advance um, here's my information there um, and again you can always go to the UIL website currently we're under uh, the pandemic situation uh, our building our UIL office is located on the campus of the University of Texas in Austin um, we are currently in lockdown because of COVID, so we all work remotely. Uh, the best way to reach us probably at this point is email. We hope in the fall that we will begin to return to in-person, but for now, shoot us emails and we watch those very carefully every day. Are there any questions that any of you would like to add? All right, well, we, well, we thank you so much for being here and um, participating and being a part of UIL. We hope it's very enriching to you and that you will certainly work alongside us to promote your students and all of their accomplishments this year. It's a great opportunity. You will see your kids grow in ways that you cannot even imagine. Any final questions? All right, thank you so much. And we will see you hopefully at additional Capitol Conference sessions for speech and debate. Not only check the live sessions, but please go to the back of the program and check those that are pre recorded. Um, and I think that you will find all kinds of information that will help you as a new coach.